right, hello everyone and welcome back. Our final session today is the Dr. Harvey Wiley Lecture and FDA Alumni Association Award. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Deborah Otto. She is Vice President of Global Regulatory Excellence at AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals. She is also Chair of the Board of Directors at the FDA Alumni Association and former Deputy, Deputy Commissioner for Global Regulatory Operations and Policy. Deb? Thank you, Colleen. Hi, everybody. It is my honor today to present the Dr. Harvey W. Wiley Award. The Wiley Award is a lectureship named in honor of Dr. Wiley, the renowned physician chemist who, at the turn of the 20th century, championed the legislative crusade against food adulteration, earning him the title of Father of the Pure Food and Drugs Act when it was enacted into law in 1906. The winner of today's Wiley Award is Dr. Luciana Borio. Dr. Borio is a Brazilian American infectious disease physician and public health administrator. She's a senior vice president in, at Inquitel, a nonprofit venture capital firm focused on the delivery of innovative technologies to national security agencies. Wu also serves as a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Codagenics, consultant to Goldman Sachs, member of the board of Eagle Pharmaceuticals, and as a senior fellow for global health at the Council on Foreign Relations. Wu obtained her MD from George Washington University completed a residency in internal medicine at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Medical Center, as well as a combined fellowship in infectious diseases at Johns Hopkins and critical care at the National Institutes of Health. She previously served as director for medical and biodefense preparedness at the National Security Council, where she coordinated the response to the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, efforts to combat antimicrobial resistance, and the development of an executive order to modernize America's influence overseas. And here you see a picture of Lou at WHO working with West African colleagues to combat Ebola. Prior to that, Lou served as the acting chief scientist at FDA and the FDA assistant commissioner for counterterrorism policy. She is an adjunct assistant professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University, and here shown in Liberia with lab workers for the PREVAIL study, the Partnership for Research on Ebola Vaccines in Liberia. Uh, note Phil Krauss uh, from CBER, also in the picture. And also among uh, those very important accomplishments, she did the first FDA Alumni Association online webinar last summer when we pivoted to remote events and she spoke about COVID-19 issues. You can see her here with Lisa Barclay, uh, who's currently HHS Deputy Chief Counsel, a former FDA Alumni Association board member, uh, and also uh, active Alumni Association members and activity committee members, and Hogue and Sohail Mosadegh. So that was a great event and we thank Lou for doing that. And also among Lou's other uh, great accomplishments, just to share a few highlights from her illustrious career, in the top left, that is Lou at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation headquarters, setting up an MOU on regulatory science. And uh, note there also with Marion Gruber on the left. Uh, in the middle, she's featured at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in a program with Steve Morrison, who managed bio programs for Ebola. In the bottom left at the National Security Council with General McMaster when he was National Security Advisor. And on the bottom right, testifying with the man who also needs no introduction, Dr. Anthony Fauci, but what you may not know is that Dr. Fauci was the 2018 FDAAA Wiley Award winner. So uh, Lou, you're following in uh, good footsteps. So with that, uh, I wanna turn it over to Lou. I wanna let you all know that you can ask questions via the chat function. We'll hopefully have some time at the end for Lou to answer some of those questions. Lou, thank you so much for being here and congratulations on your award, over to you. Well, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for this really warm introduction, Deb. I'm so honored to be joining you today and to be receiving this award. I'm uh, a little nervous and I'll start by telling you a story. So I grew up in Brazil and I often heard my mom trot out this line. If only I knew then what I know now. And I would say, why don't you just teach me? And then she would say, I can't teach you. There are some things in life that you need to learn for yourself. Some things need to be experienced to be understood. 
And that's why I decided to join the FDA in 2008. That was shortly before the 2009 influenza pandemic. Does anybody even remember that now? So in the aftermath of 9-11, I was working at Johns Hopkins and took a temporary assignment at the Health and Human Services at HHS uh, with then Secretary Tommy Thompson. He put together a team to prepare for bioterrorism threats. And this is before program BioShield or BARDA had become household names. And the main focus of the team's work was to develop smallpox and anthrax vaccines. And in those days, I would hear my HHS colleagues complain endlessly about, quote, the FDA bureaucrats. However, when these bureaucrats appeared at the Humphrey Building for meetings, I would invariably be in awe of their knowledge, expertise, and commitment to public health. So in 2008, I heeded my mother's advice and realized that if I really wanted to learn about the FDA, I had to experience it firsthand. And I'm you know, so grateful to Norman Baylor, who was then director of the Office of Vaccines for taking a chance on me. And at the FDA, I spent the next several years in what has been some of the most fun, productive and challenging years of my career. Initially, as a reviewer in the Office of Vaccines, working you know, with amazing people like Marion Gruber and Phil Kraus and the whole team that is now you know, working behind the scenes under incredible pressures since the early days of COVID. And at the end, onset of the last pandemic, 2009 flu pandemic, I transitioned to the commissioner's office to help Jesse Goodman in the office of the chief scientist. He was then the chief scientist to help coordinate FDA's pandemic work. And when it was over, we, uh, Jesse and I, with a great team in the office of the counterterrorism and emerging threats launched what's now the FDA's medical countermeasures initiative designed to expedite the development and availability of countermeasures to the US population in an emergency. You know, one of my late mentors, General Phil Russell, used to say that everybody likes coordination, but nobody likes to be coordinated. And it wasn't that easy at FDA to do this kind of coordination. The medical product centers are not so keen on it, but you know, I'm really amazingly pleased with the work that the team did. They were very driven. And I know that their accomplishments have, have been lasting. Um, and I speak for the whole team when I say also that we are very indebted to Don Beers and the Office of the Chief Counsel because he was one of our earliest uh, supporters and provided tremendous assistance as we began to build that program uh, back you know, many, many years ago. Um, a few years later, I was then promoted to the role of acting chief scientist. And again, I counted my lucky stars for having the opportunity to lead such a diverse and talented team at FDA. And one of the contributions that I'm most proud of is to have launched FDA's grand rounds to give FDA scientists a platform to share their valuable regulatory science research with external audiences. And looking back at my years at FDA, I was so fortunate to have worked with so many special people and also amazing FDA leaders like Jesse Goodman, Josh Sharfstein, Peggy Hamburg, and Scott Gottlieb, just to name a few. Um, I'm so glad I joined the FDA. Uh, before you know, coming here today, I felt that I needed to learn a bit more about Harvey Wiley. And everybody knows of Wiley as the American chemist who fought for the passage of the landmark Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 and later became FDA's first commissioner. So my research led to a fascinating bit of history, at least to me. And it's not about the poison squad, which you all know about. What I learned is that we have Dr. Wiley to thank for the great American ketchup. Most Americans don't know this, but American ketchup and Heinz in particular is coveted all over the world. Growing up in Brazil, it wasn't that easy to get my hands on a good old bottle of Heinz unless a friend was traveling to the US and agreed to smuggle a bottle back home. And it wasn't until 1990 that the Brazilians could buy Heinz ketchup in their own country. And you may ask, you know, what makes Heinz ketchup so delicious? I think most agree that it's the proportion of salt, vinegar, and sugar. And we can thank Harvey Wiley for that. Because Wiley wanted foods to be pure and free of preservatives. Uh, but ketchup was full of fillers at the turn of the century. Heinz figured out how to make ketchup without preservatives, 
by applying hurdle technology. So he combined the right amount of vinegar, salt and vinegar, added some very ripe tomatoes, which have the highest impact in, and ended up with this delicious thick and sweet Austin ketchup that is also preservative free. And with such a recipe at hand, but only then, Heinz campaigned for the passage of the F Pure Food and Drug Act. So Heinz support was also crucial in convincing President Roosevelt to support the act because he was quite tepid about it. And next time you bite into an impossible burger, drenched in Heinz ketchup, remember the amazing things that can happen when FDA works collaboratively with industry. Um, and speaking of the Impossible Burger, uh, I find it amazing that people like me who don't eat animal products anymore can now eat a plant-based burger that appeared to bleed just like a regular beef burger. And that's because it contains a genetically engineered heme molecule produced in E-cells. So the Impossible Burger is a product of our bio-revolution. And I'd like to spend the next few minutes speaking today about this bio-revolution. It's reach and importance, what has allowed it to flourish, and the steps that we must take in the US to nurture and maintain our lead in it. Because the same bioevolution that brought us the Impossible Burger is the one that has profound consequences for our national security, our national power, our national economy, and our national health. It extends beyond biomedicine and into planetary health and agriculture. And it has greatly accelerated in the context of this terrible pandemic. And it only exists because of the robust innovation system that we have been lucky to have in America for the last several decades, beginning around you know, World War II, actually. And this innovation system relies heavily on academia, the private sector, and government working together. And importantly, it relies also on a very strong, innovative, and scientifically grounded FDA. And I'd like to enumerate seven factors that enabled mRNA vaccines to materialize in the pandemic as quickly as they have, because these factors illustrate some of the critical underpinnings of a strong innovation system, and one that we must continue to nurture in this increasingly competitive global environment that we live in. And the first is perseverance. The concept of harnessing synthetic mRNA technology to transform our own human cells into little vaccine factories began more than three decades ago with Dr. Kariko, a Hungarian born scientist who according to reports spent decades collecting rejections. She even got demoted while at the University of Pennsylvania due to lack of funding. In an interview with Stat, she said, I thought maybe I'm not good enough I'm not smart enough. No, but she persisted. And eventually she and her collaborators, including Joe Weissman, succeeded. And their work caught the attention of scientists in the US and Germany, which led them to the formation of Moderna and BioNTech respectively. The second point is the importance of transparency and collaboration. What good would mRNA technology be without publication of the SARS-CoV sequence by Chinese scientists? which then enabled researchers at Moderna and BioNTech to get right to work to make these vaccines. Well, we now know that the publication of the viral sequence would have been even more delayed if it had not been for a scientific collaboration. And let me explain. A Chinese lab had mapped the genome sequence of the virus as early as December 27th, which is three days before the International Society for Infectious Diseases alerted the world that a number of people in Wuhan, China had been diagnosed with unexplained pneumonia. On January 5th, Professor Zhang, a researcher at Shanghai Public Health Clinical Center, uploaded the genome to the US National Center for Biotechnology Information. But only about a week later, he published the genome sequence online for the world to see. And this was done at the urging of his Australian collaborator. He convinced Zhang to do that. And only after that, China officially shared the genome with the World Health Organization. And sadly, the Chinese government penalized Zhang and ordered the temporary closure of his lab. So as the NIH and other USG agencies continue to ramp up efforts to protect our IP, we must do so 
in a way that also protects legitimate scientific collaboration. It is another critical underpinning of our biorevolution. The third aspect is the importance of foundational research. In the US, vaccine makers, they tweaked the mRNA sequence to make the vaccines more immunogenic, more potent, more protective. But how do they know how much tweaking was needed or how to tweak? Well, these COVID vaccine designers leverage knowledge accrued over decades studying the spike protein of pathogens like HIV, as well as other coronaviruses like SARS and MERS. In other words, basic research paved the way for these successful vaccines. Number four, a vibrant scientific and technology ecosystem, an SMT ecosystem. And take, for example, DARPA, a US defense agency that, to paraphrase my good friend Steve Usden, specializes in turning science fiction into reality. DARPA helped mRNA technologies mature into companies. When DARPA began pursuing nucleic acid vaccines in 2011, it was far from clear that they would work. But DARPA takes risks where other agencies will not. It pursues mission-driven high-risk, high-reward technologies, and it's laser-focused on achieving new capabilities. It adds non-dilutive funding to companies and helps to risk the science, which then enables these companies to attract private investment. And it's a model that is so different from the NIH. Instead of multi-year grants, it awards milestone-based contracts. I'm not favoring DARPA model over the NIH model by no means, but the point here is that a vibrant SNT ecosystem requires all of these models. The fifth is the importance of enabling technologies. The, power, the, the powerful countermeasures that have been deployed in the last few months wouldn't be possible without enabling technologies created by thousands of innovative companies across the world. These are companies that are not making the headlines necessarily. For example, companies that compress the time required to screen for and discover antibodies, or companies that have expedited the vaccine clinical trials. One such company helped identify trial sites by using artificial intelligence, by creating models that forecasted where cases were emerging up to eight weeks in advance of a surge, and then help ensure that trial enrollment was representative of the diverse population. These types of companies rely largely on, largely on private capital, which is our translational engine to bring novel and disruptive ideas from the lab and into the real world. Number six, I think it's important to acknowledge the exceptional leadership um, role in our innovation system. Our missteps in tackling COVID will go into the history books, but one aspect worked well and that's Operation Warp Speed. Who would have thought that an army logistics general paired with a senior pharmaceutical executive would join forces and set the pace for what ended up being a very successful program to develop vaccines in record time? According to those who work closely with General Perna and Monsef Slawi, they quickly developed rapport and learned to use each other's strengths. They established a clear vision of success and conveyed it to their team. And the fun part is that they were known for their quotes, mm -hmm. like check your egos at the door, flip your badge around. Now you don't work for HHS or DOD. You work for one team, the team that is entrusted with delivering vaccine to the American people. And one of my favorites, take me to people who can say yes. And the last factor is the importance of a great regulatory system. In this case, I'd like to highlight the work of FDA's Office of Vaccines Research and Review, led by Drs. Gruber and Krauss, because they knew the stakes were great. They balanced the need for speed and the need for reliable data. A misstep would erode trust in vaccines, and that they knew we could not afford. They were steady and unwavering. They developed guidance that was lauded by vaccine developers, scientists, and the public. They insisted on the gold standard and hard endpoints and statistical significance. They rejected the notion of pandemic exceptionalism. And they set an example to the international colleagues and gave credence that the FDA was still the preeminent regulatory agency in the world. I know they must be exhausted, but their work is not finished. 
and I'm in awe of the team and thankful for their unwavering commitment to public health in this critical time in our history. Well, what comes next in this bioevolution and the wave of innovations that this pandemic unleashed? It's hard to predict unless, of course, you are The Economist magazine, which in 2007 had a cover that read, what physics was to the 20th century, biology will be to the 21st century, and RNA will be a vital part of it. Of course, the mRNA story will not end with COVID. In the coming years, biotechnology innovations will increasingly impact multiple industries and transform the global economy. They will enable societies to reduce disease, hunger, and petrochemical dependence. It's also a fact that the United States faces a range of complex and diverse biological threats. Maintaining our lead in biotech is a matter of economic competitiveness and also a matter of national security. But it won't be easy. We're facing formidable competition, especially from China, which has made no secret that it intends to win the biorevolution. So what must we do? First, we must reverse the trend in, in spending that exists today. Federal spending on R&D fell from about 1.5% of GDP in the early 1960s to just around 0.6% today. We need to reverse this trend. Second, we must do a better job in developing, attracting, and retaining scientific and STEM talent. The anti-Asian sentiment that rose sharply in recent years has done little to protect our IP from theft and I fear could turn off important collaborations and a generation of young sci Asian American scientists from actually pursuing a career in science. Third, the idea of convergence, the um, scientific innovations of the future rely on convergence of bio, AI, 5G, uh, and more. And we must build our national s and infrastructure, including its education system in a way that facilitates the convergence of disciplines. Fourth, we must address the ethical, legal, and social implications, also known as LC, of novel technologies. We need to modernize our LC framework while adhering to our most cherished values if we are to reap the benefits of our tech prowess. We can't let and outdated systems of values hold us back anymore. Um, and importantly, political leadership. The bottom lines at the highest levels of the US government and bipartisan congressional support are required to unleash the next wave of innovations. Sadly, bio threats will persist. And as we modernize our biodefense systems, we need to build a system that generally attends to public health disparities and builds robust surveillance systems, supply chains, and clinical trial capabilities. We can't be preparing for the last COVID pandemic. We must skate to where the puck will be next. Just like of, of <laughs> I can never say his name, Ovechkin last night against the Bruins. To me, what's most exciting is that a strong and vibrant FDA is gonna be central to all of this. Thank you so much again for having me today. Thank you, Lou. Wow, that was uh, amazing. That was really inspiring. And uh, I think also very insightful as to where we need to be focusing in the future in order to uh, help <laughs> overcome and avoid things like this in the future. I, I have a question for you. I know we're, we're going to see some questions come in for the audience, but I constantly hear people say, COVID-19 happened. Nobody knew this was coming. Can you believe this happened? It's so shocking. And I'd love to ask, ask you as someone who spent years working in Syria, would you say something like COVID was a surprise? Was not a surprise? We were as prepared as possible. We weren't really prepared. What, what do you say when people say things like that to you? Yeah, so well, I think it's a little bit of both, right? So we know that we knew that COVID was clearly, uh, we always knew that uh, pandemic flu or a similar a virus, something that is easily transmissible, transmissible via the respiratory route could, um, would be probably the cause of the next pandemic. We were not prepared, right? So most of the efforts were actually dedicated to solving 
the easy one, which is flu, which is not easy at all, but at least there's a, you know, there's an infrastructure that happens every year during season of flu that we can build upon. And the efforts then will say, how do we actually make sure that that infrastructure that works for season of flu can be ramped up to address the needs of a pandemic? So it's a question of, you know, building the Delta. For coronavirus, it didn't have any foundation because commercial diagnostic manufacturers did not have you know, coronavirus tests sitting on their, in their, in their shelves. There are no uh, antivirals ready to be repurposed like we have for flu. There was no um, you know, factories uh, that make flu vac uh, coronavirus vaccines every year. So clearly it's a, it was a much bigger, it's a much bigger challenge. But you know, there's no excuse. I mean, we 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 and we are not prepared for flu anyway. You know, it's not like we were prepared for flu. And then you know, and, and as we faced the, the pandemic, we didn't really come together to make use of all the capabilities that we have. You know, in this amazing country. And do you feel like with the ideas that you put out that we can be sufficiently prepared for the next one, or do you think there's some kind of now, this maybe this is a political question, but national infrastructure that's missing. I mean, if you had a, if you could wave a magic wand, what would you put in place? Yeah, I mean, I do think that you know it's very critical that you know the the good thing and the good thing is that uh, these are the, the investments. I think it's it's clear now that you know there's no need to have two lines of investments. You know, for the bio defense and for this bio revolution, you know, we need it as a country. We need to really maintain our leadership. It's important for the world that we do that, and uh, and those investments uh, are the ones in the right way are the ones that are going to allow us then to respond to these biological threats, improve surveillance systems. Think about the diagnostic tests that are been that are now in use that were you know. The technology was fairly mature, but there was no market, there was no incentive, there was no, the consumer demand wasn't there either, you know, for now people actually want to be tested and they want to be tested at homes and the convenience of their homes. So there's a, a lot of innovation that they go hand in hand. And I think we do need to, to, to do focus on, you know, I mean, the big picture that I, that I mentioned, you know, in order to get it right for the next pandemic. Do you think there's anything we have, uh, a captive audience here, as well as a, a lot of members of the FDA Alumni Association who want to hear from you. What do you think people should be doing? Should they be out there encouraging people to get vaccinated? Should they be otherwise? I mean, what, what do you think we can do as citizens and hopefully relatively educated citizens to make things better either now or in the future? In some ways? I think in the immediate term, Deb, I think there's a huge mm -hmm. amount of misinformation out there. And I think it's very important for people to, to do their job, to do their, their part, to increase. Uh, I, I know, you know in my own neighborhood, I've, <laughs> I can count the number of people that decided to get a vaccine after having a conversation. Nothing beats that in-person interaction, you know, and we are trusted people. I think that in the long term, it'll be really helpful for folks like us to make sure that um, you know, the evidence generation engine is, goes back into uh, full speed in a rigorous way. You know, you know, that like very few of the trials that were done really led to any interpretable data. And it's a real failure of the system. I didn't touch on that today. I could have, it would have been another hour of talking, I could have, you know, about, you know, how did this happen? How is it that we, we allow this to happen? Yeah. No, I think that's right. Well, I think there, there's some really good lessons learned. Um, I know Amy is coming in because I, I know we're running out of time. Lou, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights with all of us. Congratulations on your award. Uh, I think that Dr. Wiley thank would you. be inspired to hear what you had to say. Uh, and because you have so many great thoughts and, and not just because of the ketchup, although that's really helpful to know too. And uh, glad that you shared that with us as well. And uh, congratulations and thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And let me add my thanks to Deb and Luciana. Uh, I thought that was a very thoughtful and insightful lecture and, and in the spirit, exactly in the spirit of the Wiley Lecture and Award. So congratulations to you. Thank you, Deb, again, for 
hosting our final session of the day and making it so thoughtful and interesting and making me want some ketchup. So I hope everyone will join us for the virtual reception from 5.30 to 6, a nice way to connect with people in a way that is more difficult in the virtual environment, no doubt about it. For those who are unable to do that, we will see you tomorrow uh, in our second day of the conference. Thank you, everybody.